Good morning. So I'm going to start with a little love story. I fell in love in 2009. I fell in love with Go's concurrency model at a tutorial taught by Rob Pike. You see, I had been programming in distributed systems in C++ at Google for several years, and I thought of concurrency in terms of callbacks and locks and thread pools. And Go introduced me to a new way of thinking about my programs. So for example, I had a couple of libraries for reading and writing data and replicated big tables, like you know, large-scale distributed storage systems. And each of my libraries for reading and writing was 700 lines of twisty callback-ridden C++. And so I decided to try converting them to Go. And I was able to get them down to under 100 lines. And the code was so much clearer. And it made the concurrent algorithm so much simpler to understand that I was actually able to combine them. And this, to me, was a revelation. Um, after that experience, I began contributing to the Go libraries inside Google, and I joined the team full-time in 2011 to make Go a production language. While my work has focused on scaling Go to larger systems and teams, my love of the language is always centered around its concurrency model. Today, I want to talk to you about how studying real-world systems can help us become better Go programmers. Go was my first practical introduction to CSP, the concurrent communicating sequential processes model. For me, the real charm in this model is how it mirrors the real world. I live in New York City, a place that's constantly striving to scale with increasing population and tourism. I see concurrency and communication in the myriad systems that keep the city running. I ride the subway to work. I'm reminded daily of the system's limited capacity and variable latency. And every election day, I'm reminded of the massive parallel computation we run to sum up a few very important numbers. We see concurrency and contention throughout this process and repeated aggregation and communication as we work towards the final totals. But most of all, I see concurrency in services, in systems that serve requests that need to deliver results quickly and reliably to handle incoming load gracefully and scale to meet the city's ever-growing demands. Today, I'm going to present a simulation written in Go of one real-world system, a coffee shop. I created this simulation to explore a few properties of services, latency, throughput, contention, and utilization. I evaluated several implementations of the coffee shop in Go, each one mapping to a slightly different real-world scenario. I hope to show you the power in Go's model and what we can learn about system dynamics with this simulation. The simulator is a kind of benchmark harness that exercises various implementations and measures their performance. This diagram shows the Go routines and channels that form the harness. The first stage generates load, in this case being customers for the coffee shop. The second stage executes the function being measured, in our case, an order coffee and wait function. This stage measures how long the function takes to execute and reports that duration to the final Go routine, which aggregates the results. We vary the number of Go routines in the second stage, which you can think of as the number of people requesting a coffee simultaneously. And we'll vary the function being executed by that stage to explore the design space and find the best performing coffee shop. Our order coffee and wait function makes a latte. In our simulation, this happens in four steps. Step one, grind the coffee beans. Step two, make espresso using the grounds. Step three, steam the milk. And step four, combine the espresso and the milk to make the latte. By default, each of these steps uses CPU for one milliseconds, and that's a full CPU burn. Nothing else can run on that CPU at that time. So if we do the four steps in sequence, the total time to prepare the latte is four milliseconds. This code shows the ideal brew function, which runs the four steps and returns the latte. The first step grinds the coffee using the grinder and returns the grounds. The second step prepares the coffee using the espresso machine and the grounds. The third step steams the milk using the steamer. And the final step makes the latte using the coffee and milk. These two charts, charts show the performance of our coffee shop as we vary the number of CPUs from 1 to 6. In the ideal implementation, we can prepare as many lattes in parallel as our CPUs can handle. So with one CPU, we can prepare one latte in 4 milliseconds. Our throughput, or rather brewput, is 250 lattes per second. Oh, just wait. This is the starting point on the left-hand chart. Throughput scales linearly with more CPUs. So with six CPUs, we get 1,500 lattes per second. On the throughput chart, higher values are better. The right-hand chart shows the median time required, required to make a latte. The cafe au latency stays flat at four milliseconds. 
On this chart, lower values are better. We'll return to charts just like these throughout the talk to compare our implementations. Unfortunately, our ideal coffee shop isn't too realistic. In a real coffee shop, each of these three steps requires a specific machine, a grinder for the grinding the coffee, machine, the coffee beans, an espresso for making the espresso, and a steamer for steaming the milk. In the simulation code, these machines are real data structures that track the latency for each stage. Just as it would not work for multiple people to use the same machine simultaneously, it is a race for multiple goroutines to call add on the same machine data structure simultaneously. And indeed, if we run the ideal implementation with multiple CPUs and enable the race detector, we get a runtime error indicating the data race. So our first lesson is remember to test with a race detector. But you all knew that already. There's another useful tip here. If you create a simulation in Go, you can use a race detector to check that you're synchronizing access to shared resources properly. So how can we prevent multiple goroutines from accessing the same machine simultaneously? One way would be to put a lock on the entire set of machines. This would be, again, to use a real-world analogy, like putting all the coffee machines in a small kitchen and only allowing one person in at a time. The code on the right implements this whole kitchen locking scenario. When we measure this scenario, we find the exact opposite of the ideal scenario. Throughput stays flat at 250 lattes per second, and latency grows linearly with CPUs. Why? because there is no way for more than one person to make a coffee at a time. Each additional CPU is another person waiting in line to make their coffee. When the nth person joins the line, they must make, wait four milliseconds for each of the preceding n minus one people. Of course, we know we can do better than this because we see better in the real world. In the real world, different people can use different machines simultaneously, as long as the kitchen is big enough. One person can use a grinder while another makes espresso and a third can steam their milk. Now, this isn't a traditional coffee shop with baristas behind the counter. This is more like a self-serve coffee kitchen where anyone can use any machine. We'll come back to the barista model later. In Go, we can implement this scenario using a mutex for each machine. A Go routine locks the grinder mutex, then uh, uses a grinder, then unlocks it. it. Then it locks the espresso machine mutex and so on. So now, instead of locking the whole kitchen for four milliseconds, we're just locking each of the three machines for one millisecond each. The fourth phase, making the latte with the coffee and milk, doesn't need any locks at all. Now, our throughput and latency curves look more interesting as we add CPUs. Up to four CPUs, throughput grows linearly and latency stays flat, just like in our ideal implementation. But with the fifth and sixth CPUs, throughput stays flat and latency starts increasing, somewhat like our whole kitchen locking scenario. Well, what's happening here? When there's just three people in the kitchen, each takes their turn at the machine and moves on. Beyond three, each additional person needs to wait their turn because all the machines are in use. Notice, though, that the latency is increasing much more slowly than in the whole kitchen locking scenario. This is because the pipeline of people making coffee is advancing each millisecond instead of every four milliseconds. We enabled greater parallelism and increased our throughput by minimizing the time we held the lock on any one resource. We're also avoiding holding any locks at all during the fourth phase, as there's no contention on any shared resource in that step. But why does throughput flatten after four CPUs? To understand what's happening, let's model how this coffee making schedules onto CPUs. The first coffee runs on CPU one, taking one millisecond per stage. The second coffee waits one millisecond to use the grinder and then can proceed in parallel on CPU 2. The third coffee waits again for the grinder and proceeds on CPU 3. And same with the fourth copy on CPU 4. But what about the fifth? By the time the grinder is free, CPU 1 is free again, so it can run there. It can't possibly start sooner because the grinder is fully utilized. This pattern continues indefinitely. There's no way for this system to use more than four CPUs in parallel because of contention on the grinder. That is why the throughput of the system flattens at 1,000 lattes per second, four CPUs running at 250 lattes per second each. So given this structural limit, how can we increase the performance of our system? Let's think about the real world again. If you wanted to make a coffee and saw people lining up to use the machines, what would you do? Well, it depends on how long the line is. You might just give up, but let's assume you really need that coffee. 
The problem is that our critical resources, the three machines, are running at capacity. You'd probably find another place to get your coffee, and this suggests the remedy. If there were a second set of machines or a second coffee shop, more people could make coffee simultaneously. So what happens if we double our machines? So we have two grinders, two espresso machines, and two steamers. Let's simulate this and find out. One way we can implement this scenario in Go is by creating a buffer channel of size 2 for each machine type and putting two machines on each channel. Now, instead of locking a mutex, the Go routine receives from the channel to gate access to one of the two machines. When it's done with the machine, the Go routine sends the machine back on the channel. With two sets of machines, we see ideal performance up to six CPUs. Throughput in increases linearly, and latency stays flat. Here's another way to compare the performance of the implementations we've seen so far. The chart on the left shows the throughput of each implementation when running with six CPUs. The chart on the right shows their latency distributions. Rectangles indicate the middle 50% of latencies, while the vertical lines indicate the middle 90%. So for example, the locking scenario, the whole kitchen locking scenario, has a throughput of just 250 lattes per second. And the latencies span between 22 and 25 milliseconds, with most of them falling between 23 and 24 milliseconds. You can see that the whole kitchen locking has much lower throughput and much higher latency than our ideal implementation. The fine grain locking implementation does better, peaking at around 1,000 lattes per second due to the structural limits we saw earlier. We overcome the structural limit by adding more capacity, that is, more coffee machines. With two of each machine, we achieve ideal performance. Doubling again to four of each machine, which is that final column, it gains us nothing because we've maxed out our six CPUs. Now, our CPUs are the limiting factor. So to increase performance further, we'll need more CPUs. So in each case, our limiting factor is moved. So, so far, we've simulated a shared coffee kitchen, where each person making coffee takes turns using a shared set of machines. But that's not what we see in the real world. In the real world, we usually see a small number of baristas operating the machines. This is more efficient because there are fewer people moving around the kitchen. And baristas operate the machines much more quickly than the average customer. The next simulation I'll present is a coffee assembly line in which one person operates each machine. The first person operates the grinder, passes the grounds to the second person who makes the espresso, and so on. Let's see how this is implemented in Go. Finally, we have some Go routines and channels. In this pipeline, we have three stages, a grinder, a presser, and a steamer. The grinder receives no new orders on the orders channel, grinds the beads, adds grounds to the order, passes it along to the next stage. The presser makes espresso using the grounds and passes the coffee along to the steamer. The steamer steams the milk and passes it back to the Go routine waiting on the order. That Go routine combines the coffee and milk to make the latte. When we look at the performance of this pipeline, this is the green line, it looks a lot like the fine grain locking implementation. The latency is identical, but the throughput is slightly less until we reach six CPUs. Why is this? Latency is the time it takes to run each of the four stages in sequence, so it takes, makes sense that it would remain the same in the locking and pipeline implementations. But the pipeline's throughput is less because it is not utilizing the three contended machines as efficiently. Here's the real-world analogy to help you understand this. Consider what happens when the person using the grinder finishes grinding the beans. In the locking implementation, that person steps away from the grinder and starts waiting for the espresso machine. Someone else can start using the grinder immediately. But in the pipeline implementation, the person grinding the beans has to wait to hand off the grounds to the person making the espresso before they can start the next grind. If the second person is busy making the espresso, the first person just stands there holding out the grounds. This is a blocked channel send in our implementation, and this leaves the grinder idle, underutilizing our resources. Of course, in the real world, the person would just set the grounds down on the counter and start grinding more beans for the next coffee. That counter space allows for different stages of the pipeline to stay busy, even if they're a little out of sync. And in the real world, where grinding beans or making espresso might take more or less time due to natural variance, we need that flexibility. And we need it in our computer systems as well, because there's natural variance in these systems. So how do we model that counter space in Go? We do so by adding buffers to the channels that connect our pipeline. These buffers absorb the variance between stages, and so increase throughput and utilization. I tested pipelines with buffer size 1 and buffer size 10. The lines are overlapping on the charts. Both of these buffered pipelines outperform the unbuffered pipeline, achieving the optimal throughput of 1,000 lattes per second. 
This is because they eliminate the requirement for the stages to proceed in sync, and so allowed more work to proceed in parallel. But while we see a benefit with buffering, it's important to keep those gains in perspective. These charts should compare all the implementations we've seen, plus two multi-pipe scenarios. The multi-pipe scenarios run multiple copies of the buffered coffee pipelines, much like the multi-scenarios use multiple copies of the various machines. You can think of multi-pipe two as a world with two coffee shops next door to each other. What we see in these charts is that the differences between fine-grained locking in the various pipelines, the middle four bars, the differences are all pretty minor. The two big gains came from structural changes. The first was moving from a whole kitchen lock to fine grain per machine locks. This reduced the time spent in any one critical section so that more work could run in parallel. The second was recognizing when our existing resources were fully utilized and adding more capacity in the multi-machine scenarios. This allowed us to max out our six CPUs. The CPUs are now our limiting resource. If we want to get more throughput, we'll need to add more CPUs to run our simulation. In preparing for this talk, I tried many more scenarios than the ones I've shown you so far. I tried changing the number of stages, changing their duration, and adding random noise. I tried making the steam milk stage run in parallel with the other stages. And what's remarkable is how little any of that mattered. Most of the changes had only small effects on performance, but the structural changes provided major gains. The lesson is to identify and remove the structural barriers to parallelism in your system. Removing these barriers will help your system scale. We did this today by reducing the time spent in critical sections. We did it again by adding more replicas of contended resources. And we did this with buffering, which allowed upstream pipeline stages to proceed without blocking on downstream stages. And while we focused on the benefits of these changes, it's important to remember they also have costs, in particular, increased resource use. I also encourage you to take inspiration from real-world systems. Try to understand why they are the way they are. These insights will help you understand structural performance issues and help you discover new designs. One last thing. I encourage you all to download the simulator and play with it. The code is straightforward, less than 1,000 lines of Go for everything. Try some more scenarios, dig into the results using Go's profiling tools. The exception tracer is a particularly useful tool here. Or perhaps try modeling a new real-world system in Go. You'll learn more about how that system works and you'll learn a lot about Go itself. Thank you.